Hello and welcome to today's talk. You might be wondering why I put an image of two adults dressed as the Simpsons for this talk. And in case you didn't know, this was a performance at the live contest Strictly Contempting, which is broadcasted on the BBC every weekend during the fall each year. And these two adults, not only did they dress as the Simpsons, but they also managed to dance it to the tune of the TV series. And it's definitely a performance the audience will not miss. And you might want to catch up on it afterwards. It's related to today's talk because we're going to be talking about performance, but in a different scenario. And it is how in the BBC we fine tune the performance of our data warehouse for which we use Amazon Redshift. And this actually helped deliver faster business insights across the business. So the agenda for today. First things first, we're going to be introducing you to the BBC data platform. Then I will introduce you also to Amazon Redshift because I will not assume that you have used it or that you have prior experience on it. And then our journey and the challenges that we faced. Then we're going to take a, deep, you know, a bit of a lighter dive into the metrics available in Amazon Redshift overall. And then how uh, we added some things on top of those metrics to help us kind of measure the progress uh, in the performance that changes that we were making over time and then how you know which changes uh, we applied incrementally and how those kind of showcase uh, across those metrics and to end things uh, we will summarize what things we have learned together so what is the the bb service data platform well in a nutshell what we do is we handle real-time analytics needs across all data we hold on our audience members. This is our biggest data set, but we also hold other information from our users, such as the registration information or their interactions with uh, mobile apps or even uh, audio video content that they watch. And even, even uh, social media feeds uh, that we also kind of cross into uh, with the analytics information. Taking a look at the typical data ingestion journey uh, that happens in the BBC data platform, I've taken an example of the analytics data. So it starts on the left with audience members interacting with BBC via BBC News or iPlayer, or they're maybe listening uh, to a podcast on BBC Sounds. And data is collected on the back of that uh, and uploaded to an analytics web server. And then from then on, uh, we will receive those logs and those logs be begin their journey uh, in our AWS platform uh, through an ingestion process that we call and that data is validated, it is cleansed, uh, there's also some transformations applied to it which we call enrichments and then at the end of that processing uh, the data ends up being stored in what we call a data lake. Uh, and this, in big data terms, is essentially just file storage in the cloud at scale. Uh, in our case, this is Amazon S3, but if you are in Google Cloud Platform, it could be just file storage in there. And a subset of that data will end up being ingested in a data warehouse, which is mainly used for exploratory uh, analysis or for other analytics needs. And in our case, this data warehouse is Amazon Redshift. On the other end of things, we have our internal users. These are made of uh, analysts and data scientists mainly. And what they do is they use that data to understand audience behavior and to also report on different metrics uh, that are important to the business, such as are we reaching uh, underserved uh, groups? Across the, United, uh, across the UK's nations and regions, for example, are we uh, providing diverse enough content and other metrics such as that. A few numbers uh, that we deal with so that you kind of have a frame of reference uh, for our big data platform. Every day we ingest billions of records. Within the first year of launching on analytics pipeline, we actually duplicated the number of records so it has been, it's been quite a challenge in, in scaling our systems up. This means that in our data lake, we have uh, a few petabytes of data stored. 
and in our data warehouse, uh, we are in the terabyte scale. So I think we're up to like 40, 40 terabytes of, of scale these days, and it's only ever increasing. So what about uh, Redshift and what have been our, our journey? Uh, what has been our journey in our data warehouse? Well, Redshift is essentially a big data warehouse on the cloud. It's provided by Amazon and it's a managed service. It is on the back of things, a cluster of machines that act uh, as a holder of your data. And we interact with it just like any other uh, database via SQL. It's a bit of a, uh, some tweaks uh, in the SQL that you write, and this is due to how the data is stored internally. So the, the way the data is partitioned and distributed among the cluster of, of machines is using columnar storage. And what columnar storage does is it kind of portions and partitions your data so that when you are going to query it, you can uh, get return uh, of the results across billions of records uh, as fast as we can. So this is really fine-tuned for kind of high volume queries. And you have a lot of control uh, in this service despite it being managed. So you can choose what type of servers you want to use. Uh, also, what scaling uh, rules up and down you want for it, depending on, on the demand. Uh, there's a a bunch of uh, configuration parameters that you can fine tweak. And also because this is very oriented towards reporting and heavy um, workloads, then you can also manage something that is called query priorities. And this is important because not all queries are created the same. In this case, for example, we are when we are ingesting data, those ingestion processes have a higher priority than if a user is doing some exploratory analysis. So there are some query rules that you can set within Redshift to allow you to kind of prioritize the most important workloads that you have. Going back to the types of data users that we have in the data warehouse, we have mainly three types of users. One of them being essentially just downstream system. So there are other applications that are running on the back of it, and they will query data sets uh, held in the data warehouse every day and do some downstream processing and kind of feed it into other areas of the BBC, of the business. Then we have the internal users, so data analysts, data scientists. Uh, they do very different types of work. One is more suited to machine learning, uh, and the other is more kind of exploratory and just kind of being able to answer quicker questions. And then we also have what we call business intelligence tools, and these are essentially dashboards, which are charts. Okay, and these are reports we will run on a weekly basis, some on a daily basis, and some on a monthly basis. And these are mainly um, driven by business business requirements and business questions and kind of different markers that we need to track over time. We've been on a journey since we started using Redshift, so that's what that was back in 2015. And since we created it in the, in the first couple of years, we had to scale up to have more space, okay, as the kind of the data needs of the business grew. Then a couple of years later, we had to migrate to a new architecture, and this was partly because of the needs for space, but in this case, it was actually more because we there were a lot of users and they were competing for kind of the usage of, of the cluster and we needed more kind of processing capacity. And then earlier this summer, we had to kind of scale up again. And in this case, it was it was driven by the search in data because since we entered lockdown, especially, there has been a search in, in data uh, usage and also data ingestion because our, our services are, are becoming ever more popular. So the summary of the challenges uh, over time has been essentially a need for space. Okay, you can only store so much data. So once you kind of reach a threshold within your cluster, you need to kind of migrate uh, or add more servers uh, to it to provide more storage. But in our case, it has been also driven by a large number of uses. So in a in a data warehouse, uh, it's is due to the type of the workloads uh, that are usually quite heavy across as um, potentially 
billions of records or even terabytes of data that this ends up hogging the CPU of the system. So ever um, in just 2019 and the beginning of 2020, we onboarded more than 150 users. So this was exponential um, increase for us. And also there's been one more challenge uh, for us. And in this case, it's actually been that, well, Redshift is a managed service, but there's been a fair amount of management that we have had to learn and to do on ourselves. Unlike other AWS services that are managed, for example, SQS or SNS, if you are familiar with them, you use them and you don't really need to think, okay, if they're available or if they need to scale, all that, all of that is just handled on the back, on the back of things uh, by Amazon for you. But in the case of Redshift, we have had to learn uh, a lot about the underlying infrastructure and about how to make the most of it so that we could get the most bang for a buck. And th this actually has given us uh, a, a really good return of investment. So going to the topic of this talk about uh, measuring frameworks and, and metrics, uh, what are the metrics that, does, uh, that are provided just out of the box by Amazon. So Redshift comes with a host of metrics. Um, the typical ones when you create servers in the cloud are the health, the CPU, how much disk is being used, uh, the IO, and a lot of this in Redshift you can actually see, t see through AWS CloudWatch. But then, because in this case, uh, we have queries and we have a finite kind of CPU, and some of these queries can be potentially very heavy or long running. Uh, you can monitor the duration of the queries. You can also see, you know, which ones are running uh, versus other ones that are waiting. And this is quite, quite important. And you can keep track of this uh, to the AWS console in Redshift. One of the graphs that we kind of do keep track of is what we call the query wait time. And this is important um, because as we have onboarded more and more users, these users, they are submitting queries into uh, the cluster to an entry point, which is uh, the leader node. And when they submit these queries, uh, there are parameters in Redshift that allow you to define how many queries can be run concurrently. And after that number is reached, the rest of the queries are queued. So as the numbers of users grow and the concurrent use of the cluster grows, then the queue of users potentially waiting for the queries to be run can grow. So it's very important to analyze over time how the usage of your available computing is, is going. And also maybe to tweak those parameters because it really depends a lot on the type of workloads. In our, in our case, uh, we've noticed a pattern since the early days where the beginning of the week or the beginning of the month is usually the heaviest periods and we have been fine tuning to actually kind of minimize those periods. And in, in the graph uh, at the bottom, you can actually see how the query kind of wait time has been, you know, decreasing as we actually implemented um, some performance features. But then uh, this talk would not be all if I was just going to talk about that which metrics. There's, there's some things that we actually have had to think uh, to kind of measure, see how we measure the, the progress of, of the changes that we're making. And before we started to making those changes, we asked ourselves a question, uh, as in, do, do Redshift me metrics actually give us enough confidence to monitor the performance, to, to understand whether what we see in the CloudWatch metrics are similar to what the experience our users are getting? So this is when we kind of shifted our view and thought, well, what about if we could measure things from the perspective of, of our users and, and understand more and measure that and understand not only the users, but what about the reporting dashboards? These are very critical to the business. Are they refreshing uh, when they need to? Are also the downstream systems getting the data when they need to? And then uh, once we kind of thought about that, we, we went about what are the changes that we want to make? Okay, we, we set up the kind of the initial um, metrics that we we're going to look into. And we thought about three different focus areas for this. So 
The first one was understanding more how the data was being used, not only to kind of react to it as things were, were going and perhaps some queries were running for a long time, but also identifying where were our users kind of going towards? Uh, can we anticipate any, any future needs? The second one was working more closely to, with our users because they were also uh, telling us some of the challenges they were facing when making the most of this data. And then the last one was um, engaging more closely with Amazon because they own the product. And we thought, well, working more closely with them is going to allow us to understand things things better and see what's, what's coming up. So what did we do with our users? Well, uh, we did actually initially have a workshop with some of our power users. And these were uh, the most kind of engaged, most experiences and, and kind of brainstormed together uh, what were the problems they were seeing. And some of them actually proposed uh, some solutions and, and we kind of invited them to, to join our team for, for a set amount of time to kind of deliver those changes together. And as these users joined the team and worked together, actually our team had a lot more ideas about what things we could do that could help in, uh, improve the performance better. The next one was working with Amazon. So we engage with the Amazon uh, team and we did together what is called a operational review of, of Redshift. And what this means is we uh, we did together analysis of the usage based on some, uh, some data that is actually held within Redshift. So Redshift does whole data about its own performance. And these are called system tables. And what this gave us was very clear kind of guidelines on what were the things, what were the patterns of usage in a cluster and also how those were lining up with the best practices from Amazon. And it gave us very key points, very key areas that if we invested in improving them, then it was going to significantly improve the performance. In summary, what are some of the changes that we made? Well, uh, one of the big things was automating space management. So we went through these exercises now and then where we were asking users to delete data sets that they were not using, but that sometimes users forget. And it was just very, very tricky. So overall, we needed to kind of keep the space managed within a threshold because when you are doing exploratory analysis in, in a big data warehouse, there's a lot of kind of intermediate data sets that you create and intermediate tables. So you need kind of certain threshold of free space. Otherwise, things just will not run and then also tweaking that kind of query, those query priorities and long running queries, being able to monitor them better. That was also one, one of, a, one of the very, very key things. And then training our users. So some of the most advanced users, what they needed was actually to just write more performance queries, but then people who are actually kind of just migrating from Excel into a big data warehouse, what they needed was just training to kind of lose that fear of writing their first report in SQL. Having gone through these changes, uh, let's, let's, go, let's go back into that kind of initial framework for measuring improvement that we set up and how, how this, this, did all these changes kind of end up showing up in, in our um, dashboard. So we, we saw that in oh, month over month, things got a lot better. And this was actually tracking queries that our users told were noticeably heavy and were also driving uh, key critical business uh, metrics. But then when we broke this down week on week, we actually saw uh, there was a significant improvement, especially since uh, the beginning of July. And actually in the beginning of July this year is when we scaled up Redshift to add a little bit more space. And it was not, we know it was not only this change that actually drove the performance, but it was the lack of a space that was hindering the rest of the performance improvements from actually taking effect. This graph shows uh, one of our most uh, key reporting dashboards, which is measuring the performance of audio and video content. And it's, it's amazing to see that at some point it took up to 500 minutes to run. But then after the, after the exercise of scaling up and applying improvement, it went to below 20 minutes. So this shows how kind of tweaking the performance appropriately 
can really make a huge change. What have we learned? Well, the summary of things we have learned is the only constant is change. So when you rely on a third party provider, you need to always kind of keep up with the changes, keep up with what's coming up and also make sure that you're applying the, late, the latest uh, updates. You're kind of on the top or the closest to, to top releases um, of infrastructure. Also internally at the BBC, our storage needs are just ever increasing. So we have to kind of think ahead now as in making making better protections for the future or kind of leveraging the data lake with with our data warehouse to to make sure the the data that is most needed for analysis analysis is actually in the data warehouse and then the last one has has been that it's been through collaboration with both our, our internal users and amazon that we have been able to deliver, deliver significant uh, and impactful changes to the business and thank you. Thank you, Blanca. Sounds like uh, you've got your work cut out for you over there. Um, so much data to deal with. Um, we've uh, I've, I've posted in the uh, in the Twitch uh, stream chat uh, that if anybody has any questions for Blanca, um, to uh, um, to let us know there, and I'll I'll try and uh, try and get those into the uh, into the conversation. But we'll start with one of mine, which is. Um, You've been using Redshift since 2015 at the BBC. I understand. Um, like, how how has the platform evolved over that time, um, and and what sort of things are you, can you do now that you maybe couldn't have done previously? Uh, well, to, to say that we we started in 2015 is kind of when when things really kind of kicked off. Okay, so in 2015 we were just kind of building the platform, and and probably to say that uh, that platform became more stable. It would have been towards the end of 2017, 2018. Okay, so it, it's been uh, <laughs> quite, quite a significant kind of change in that time. Uh, I think uh, the, the kind of the measure of it is that the the number of users who, which who use that platform nowadays uh, has increased, especially on the back of that platform being more reliable. Okay, so uh, us being more stable also has kind of uh, made it more attractive to people. Uh, to kind of learn and kind of use that data. And, so, and make if you were to sort of guess at the number of users of the of the platform, what what sort of number is that? So, I think now we're probably closer to two hundred and fifty wow. something around that. So that's uh, so, pretty pretty significant. So, yeah. you're uh, you're you really are uh, driving the entire BBC from there, I guess. Um, how many people support the platform that that number of people use then? Uh, to be honest, it's not that many. Okay, our our team uh, is made up, I think, of twenty five people these days. Okay, and this is engineers, uh, business analysts, uh, systems engineers, team leads. Okay, all all of that, and and it's quite you know it's quite significant. I talk about analytics a lot uh, because it's our highest kind of ingestion pipeline. But we have about a couple of dozen of ingestion pipelines that we have to manage at different scales, at different timelines, and and support our users. So so it's quite it's quite tricky for us sometimes to just kind of have the conversations to prioritize what is the most important thing that we need to focus on yeah. now. Always the problem, right? Figuring out what what's the what's the most valuable thing to do do first, yeah. Um and um do you do you make use of things other than redshift in that landscape? Have you got have you looked at uh, Elastic Map Reduce, Athena, the are the things that also kind of answer some of the same questions or are you like fully redshift? Uh, yes, we, we've actually uh, had had a look at those as well. Uh, the ma the main thing uh, for us is well, uh, basic things when you work with data, such as keeping the data secure, managing the access, making sure that uh, that data doesn't end up in places that uh, if you are familiar with GDPR, the data mm -hmm. protection law, okay, you need to be able to guarantee uh, and. Athena is also something that we use, but we're not very heavy into. And part of the reason is the cost, okay, to be honest, because in Athena you pay per query, and in Redshift you actually uh, pay for the for the capacity, and then uh, if you kind of manage that capacity appropriately, it's very cost effective, okay? So, so far we're more using Redshift, but uh, we're always looking at the new products yeah, and, that are coming out. And aren't up. there a lot of new products, like, all the time? So difficult to stay, stay afloat. <sighs> well... 
you you'd be surprised you know even you know within the the amazon landscape that our team is mostly in there are other teams at the bbc who are in other cloud platforms as well but um but for us just kind of keeping up with amazon is is already quite challenging yeah. at times because they develop Absolutely. really fast. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I recertified with my Solutions Architect Pro this week and passed. Go me. Um, and there was just so much new stuff in there since the, the last time I took it three years ago. Um, like just a, a variety of things that I haven't even touched either. It's, um, just keeping up is, is tricky. Um, we've got a couple of, of questions from the uh, from the audience, which is great. So um, uh, Gurdasani uh, asks, uh, have you found effective use cases for your data lake? How do you manage data schemas in that data lake? Oh, that, that's a very interesting <laughs> one. <laughs> well, to, to be honest, I think it's something that we are exploring these days. So um, there's certain workloads, especially when people want to look at historical data back in time in years. Uh, use cases that we have at the BBC for that is, for example, when Olympics uh, come about, when general elections happen, is when kind of teams want to analyze things going back longer. And that, those are kind of cases that they need to go uh, into the data lake. Okay, so th- we are, we usually kind of look at them in a in a case by case uh, basis. Okay, because uh, doing kind of uh, every team at the BBC has almost like their own infrastructure and manages their own, but we kind of hold that data and then manage the access uh, patterns. And we have to be quite careful, okay, uh, with who we grant access and gotcha. where. Because even though it's sort of one one big BBC organisation, it sounds like you're you're sort of you're quite cautious about what data is available to to where. Um, what are the what are the sort of concerns that you're trying to mitigate against in in that case? So there, as, as I said, one of them is uh, guaranteeing that GDPR is met. Okay, so that the data, uh, as a as a user, you can ask an organization to kind of tell you what data they hold on you. You can also you also have a have, a, um, have the right to ask them to delete that data and effectively delete it. Okay, so you have to know where that data is in order to be able to collect it, then analyze it, but then also share it back with the user or even get rid of it altogether. Okay, so if the data ends up in all sorts of pockets and you have no idea where it is. How are you yeah, going to meet that? Yeah. It's uh, a, a struggle that everyone uh, comes across. Is that is that something that you um, you had thought about as GDPR came in, or did you sort of get a, a subject access request or a, a request to delete and then have to sort of scramble to solve mm-hmm. that problem? Well, I I, I think that after GDPR, uh, I was I was kind of like a happy software engineer in in a way. But then when, when GDPR uh, came about and that deadline kind of loomed in our team, we were having conversations with legal teams, okay, with uh, private protection and all sorts of different areas. So we need to see as a whole how are we going to tackle this, okay, and it's changed our conversations massively, okay, from not just the user aspect, but also the security aspect as well, that before... Uh, we were the ones kind of driving it and now there's a lot more understanding across the business about why it's important yeah. i uh, i had a question come up from a from a um, client today about um whether gdpr applied to cloudfront uh, requests like if you if you make a request of cloudfront in the us is that cloudfront host a data processor for the uh, purposes of, of gdpr um which uh, i hadn't considered before um the gdpr has made all of our lives a lot more complicated i think in general <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So another it's question funny. from uh, from Gurdasani in the uh, in the chat there. Um, do you monitor the performance of your ETL jobs loading data into the data warehouse, and how do you ensure that these perform predictably as the volume of data increases? That that's a very good question. So uh, yes, we also have metrics, okay, out, outside of the data warehouse to see how each one of the jobs is performing, and we do get alerts when they don't, for example, finish at the time they're expected because there's a lot of uh, people and a lot of dashboards and a lot of decisions that kind of depend on that data arriving at the right time. And obviously we are ingesting that data from upstream sources and third parties. So we also have ways of monitoring if we're getting the data from them at the time that we expect. And if not, we have kind of automated emails that are sent to them saying, hey, you know, it, is anything happening? Uh, the data is delayed from our side. Gotcha. And as the as the as the data sort of scales, are you are you constantly putting work into 
making those uh, those insert jobs take less and less time is that something that you're you're sort of actively having to spend a lot of time on so i think it's more uh for us it's been kind of auto scanning so for example a thing at the bbc is big news days uh whenever there's some some news going on uh and this year has been them. just basically every week there's been a big news day yeah so in the beginning we were, we were always kind of maybe more actively monitoring things that we were just like oh my god is the auto scaling policy going to be effective okay are, are the systems going going to be able to cope because uh, along those ingestion pipelines there's a series of of lambda functions of uh, ec2 services of emr clusters okay there's a whole host of like cascading uh, things going on and surprisingly they they have held quite well okay uh, and the ingestion recipe at times uh, it's taken a bit longer but i think it's been more uh, because they were all the all the competing workloads at the same time so if your data is in certain shape at the time that uh, it's ingested into Redshift, then the ingest process can be quite fast. But you also uh, have to kind of read through the documentation and really kind of uh, understand what it needs, okay, and how you, for example, shape the files, how you divide them. You can fine-tune that uh, to maximize it too. Yeah. Um, final question then um, before we move on. Um, reInvent's coming up. Anything particular uh, Redshift or related or otherwise, in fact, on your wish list for, uh, for reInvent? I think uh, it would be, you know, for, for my users, okay, that I, I would love for them to have uh, kind of not better tools because they you can use, right now they can use any SQL interface uh, to access Redshift, but something that was a bit more unified because this creates all sorts of kind of support uh, queries, okay, and always, there's always like sorts of confusion. So for me, anything that improves the lives of my users, then it would also improve yeah, my life as understood. well. Um, I can see Brian in the uh, in the green room, who's uh, who's from AWS, frantically taking notes to uh, to send to the uh, the Redshift product team. So, um, may, maybe your wish will come true. We'll, we'll find out in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, thanks for for joining us on the chat, Blanca. Do stick around. We'll uh, we'll uh, have you in the panel later on. Um, thanks for your talk. See you soon.